right? So Bitcoin miners have been building for power density for a while. How much power could we cram into the smallest computer in the smallest space? Whereas GPUs were a little bit less from a power density standpoint. Now we have this super power dense one that's going to require a little bit of a rethink of how these data centers are built and cooled. So it's going to require, you know, direct liquid to chip cooling to run a lot of these because of their power density. And because of the power density, you know, you're going to have to have a lot of power in one place. So that we then took a very quick leap to data centers buying nuclear power plants or turning back on nuclear power plants or having a nuclear power plant play, which is just crazy. Welcome back to the Compass Mining Podcast. My name is Jarrett, and today I'm joined by our Chief Mining Officer, Shannon Squires. Shannon, thanks for hopping on. How are you? Hey, Jarrett. I'm doing great. Uh, it is a, as we were just kind of talking about jokingly, it is an extremely busy bear market. Uh, the market is starting to turn upward a little bit, but in general, like for Bitcoin mining, hash price is still low. Uh, so it's, and it's, I don't know, this is my third bear market, I guess, or you know, something like that. And this is the busiest one yet. Busiest one as a Bitcoin miner or busiest one? I uh, Qualify that a little bit. Like, like, what, what do you mean? Professionally, personally, I, both? <laughs> I would say as a Bitcoin miner, like I basically, when I got into Bitcoin, I immediately went into Bitcoin mining, right? So I learned about Bitcoin, figured out what it was, and then immediately started mining. I mean, I was mining altcoins at the time because I had GPUs and I could, you know, buy them off gigs on the Craigslist and get them running and mining. And that quickly transitioned to buying ASIC side and seen from China. So my entry into Bitcoin was straight into Bitcoin mining. And that was 2017, right? So that was a bull run. Went up 2018, hard crash. Um, and then, you know, we had our next run up in, what was that? 2020, something like that. So I guess this is the second, you know, big bear market that I'm, uh, been going into and, you know, and yeah, it's just, it hasn't been that hard yet. It feels like compared to like 2018. Um, but this is way busier than 2018. So it's pretty crazy. Everybody's buying sites and that's kind of like, uh, that's a big deal. Yeah, I think what we wanted to do on this episode is focus on the power and the land acquisitions or grabs, whatever nomenclature you want to use to talk about that. I will say that I also got in 2017 and I wasn't as active in that bear market. I And I wasn't in Bitcoin mining, only fairly recently in Bitcoin mining. But I will say that reading Anthony Powers articles that he's recently put out, and I'll leave those links in the description. One's actually going to come out after this recording, but he's just talking about really the maturation of the entire industry. It's becoming very, very serious and the millions are turning to billions. And I think the billions eventually will turn into trillions as far as, you know, the amount of money that the companies are eventually going to be worth. Maybe not at the end of this cycle, a trillion dollar market cap for all the companies, but definitely by the end of the the, the next cycle after the 2028 halving, um, the industry is just growing at an exponential pace. So where do you want to start with that? Do you want to start with the land maybe? And then we can talk about energy or energy and land. I'm, I'm, I'm open to anything. It, it kind of goes hand in hand. And it's something like I've been involved in trying to site Bitcoin mining farms since I got into the space. So whether that's little tiny stranded natural gas wells all the way up to, you know, 300 megawatt sites, the, and it's always for Bitcoin mining, power was always the number one and it was the cost of power, right? It didn't matter where it was located, how far away from civilization it was, what its source was, that was fairly irrelevant. Um, what mattered was the cost, right? Bitcoin has huge ups and huge downs. When it's ups, you want to take advantage of it. Cost of power probably doesn't matter during some of that. Um, but during the bear market, like what we're going through right now, cost of power is extremely important. Um, and Bitcoin miners have been living and dying on their baseline cost of power since they started this. So. It's always a race to have the most efficient hardware, to have as much hash rate online as possible. And then the other side of that is the efficiency of your operations from an OPEX standpoint, power being that biggest cost. There's other OPEX you can you know, work to improve and all that fun stuff to drive down OPEX costs, but ultimately it's that cost of power that's your biggest piece. And so when Bitcoin miners went looking for sites, it's where do I get cost-effective power? It happened to be a whole bunch of stranded renewable assets so Bitcoin mining is over 60% renewable, um, at least from all the you know US-based and some global-based surveys. Um, and so we're the most renewable energy industry there is as far as like consumption standpoint, which is pretty crazy. But that was just because that was the cheap power. The reason it was cheap is because it's intermittent. And so it's not always 
there's not always a buyer of that power on the other side of a market. And that allowed Bitcoin miners to come in and get those sites. <clears throat> so the sites were fairly agnostic. Generally, we were scraping together internet however we could. We just needed a big enough you know, connection to send a few megabits of data and you know, not have too slow of a ping. Um, and that you know expanded. You got your mega sites that came in and just continue to grow and get bigger. Um, the bigger the site, the greater need for like bandwidth within internet became. Um, and traditional data centers were like, I never really paid attention to traditional data center space. It was always like, why would you pay that much for power? Why would you pay that much for your building? It didn't make sense. Um, liked Bitcoin mining way faster to monetize the assets. So if you purchase land and power, I can get a Bitcoin mining farm running very quickly First, the traditional data center has a very long build time and procurement time and all the backup power generation, everything required for that it makes it fairly different. Um, but then. As we hit into this bear market, we saw the beginning of it, not a whole lot of crazy stuff happened because you had your, you know, what you kind of expected. There were a bunch of companies with bankrupt. So there's some pubcos that went bankrupt. There's some private companies with bankrupt. Some of them don't exist anymore. Um, some of them fought through and came out the other side. Uh, and, you know, congrats to those guys who were able to fight through that battle and do some bankruptcy restructuring and are still here to, you know, talk about it. The and then all of a sudden it started to change, like their sites started getting bought up. So over and over and over again. And usually there's a plethora of people running around scraping together sites. And, you know, maybe it's because it was a old manufacturing site or something got decommissioned and there's just a substation sitting out there with a bunch of power. You go talk to the landowner and you negotiate a deal. Um, and most of the low hanging fruit got you know, bought up anything that was distribution voltage that had a significant size to it, uh, got purchased and, you know, was off the market. So then you started seeing more and more people, you know, go down the path, you know, follow, I guess, in the path of, uh, uh was it Irene now? It used to be, uh, the, used to be Iris energy and now yeah, it's it used to be I Iris. Iron, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Like, you know, they, you know, giant substation out in the middle of Texas, you know, they own their electrical infrastructure in Canada, as far as I'm aware. And they went down that path since day one. Um, and more and more have got, went down that path, realizing that, you know, the 18 to 24 month lead time to build out a gigantic substation is not that unreasonable anymore in Bitcoin mining. Bitcoin mining <clears throat> used to have very short, and I apologize, I have a bit of a cold, used to have very short uh, timelines when they looked at their utilization because they didn't know what the bear market was going to bring. They didn't know if Bitcoin was going to go to you know, a million dollars or go to ten dollars. Um, and they were just trying to plan for both eventualities. So it's been interesting watching more and more people uh, you know, gobble up all the low-hanging fruit. Now they're going after higher voltage, transmission level voltage, requiring substations, longer lead time projects. Um, and as Bitcoin miners started securing those and like gobbling those up, all of a sudden you see this influx from the AI space or AI HPC, so traditional data center space. Um, up until here recently, like there was no difference in my eyes of what a AI HPC data center was than a, any other tier one through four data center. Um, how much redundancy do you want? How much air cooling do you want? Do you want it liquid cooled? Uh, pretty straightforward. How much you know redundant fiber connection do you need to the site? The and the cost is just exponentially more expensive than a Bitcoin mining farm. Um, but now we're like, and sorry, I'm going on a tangent and just running down a rabbit hole here thinking about this. Uh, they started gobbling up sites and buying, you know, putting in uh, load requests for very large amounts of power. You can see this in the PJM market. You can see, you know, First Energy talking about this. You can see this in MISO markets, SPP market, ERCOT. Uh, you know, they publicly talk about this, lots of news articles about the load requests. <clears throat> you know, they went from, you know, five gigawatts to hundreds of gigawatts in some of these news articles. It's kind of crazy. Um, and everybody's like got the extrapolation out there, like how fast can this grow? How big can it get? Uh, and part of the next piece that happened during this time frame, when you look at the AI space is NVIDIA was, you know, everybody was running on H100s trying to build for that. Well, now we have a new you know, processor out from NVIDIA. I don't know what it's called. Maybe it's like a B200 or something, um, but way more power dense, right? So Bitcoin miners have been building for power density for a while. How much power could we cram into the smallest computer in the smallest space? Um, whereas GPUs were a little bit less from a power dense standpoint. 
Now we have this super power dense one that's going to require a, a little bit of a rethink of how these data centers are built and cooled. So it's going to require you know direct liquid to chip cooling to run a lot of these because of their power density. Um, and because of the power density, you know you're going to have to have a lot of power in one place. So that we then took a very quick leap to uh, data centers buying nuclear power plants or turning back on nuclear power plants or having a nuclear power plant play which is just crazy. And when I saw, and like, again, you can stop me anytime, ask questions, sorry for the rant. But, uh, when I first got in this space, I'm like, well, Bitcoin miners are either going to have to buy the power plants or the utilities are going to become the biggest Bitcoin miners. And right now it looks like Bitcoin miners are transitioning to the AI space, trying to compete with the big boy hyperscalers. Don't know if they can or not, <clears throat> but those big boy hyperscalers are buying the power generation. Right, they're returning on uh, reactor one at Three Mile Island. Like that's freaking awesome. I don't know if a lot of people know. Like that ran all the way to like 2017 or 2019. So even though Three Mile Island had the meltdown of reactor two in '79, uh, the other reactor, you know, was turned back on, continued to run. They dis they shut it off because it was too expensive to run. Like there's a lot of maintenance and upkeep that goes into that. Um, now that maintenance and upkeep doesn't seem like that big of a deal when you can just sign a PPA directly with the data center, uh, and have that, you know, purchase of that power guaranteed for 20 years, like Microsoft or whoever did that deal is going to consume all of it. Um, so that's kind of like a big long run from starting out looking for little, you know, 50 KW places to get natural gas containers or Bitcoin mining farm to watching these hyperscalers, you know, either put up purchases for micro nuclear reactors or restart Three Mile Island. That's pretty crazy. Yeah, I didn't want to cut you off in that rant. That was a good rant. You literally, like I said, well, you just summed it up. You went, we went from 50 kilowatts to turning on a nuclear reactor. And that's Microsoft. They're working with Constellation Energy to get Three Mile Island up and ready for hopefully, I think 2028 is when they're trying. And the other one that I was looking at for this conversation was Google. They're, they're working with uh, Kairos Power and they're trying to get 500 megawatts on through a, a nuclear facility um, by 2030, hopefully like totally fully launched by 2035. And then the other one that I just wanted to call out and just make sure we say it on mic is that I saw this on Yahoo Finance and it was Berkshire Hathaway buys full control of its energy unit. So clearly the future is going to be who controls the picks and axes of the compute, of the AI, of the Bitcoin, of the, you know, the biggest networks out there that are going to probably be AI and Bitcoin. And so the picks and axes of that are actually running the data centers, running the compute, running the mining, but more importantly, controlling the energy that pumps into those. So I think that was a really good kind of, you know, we were buying GPUs off Craigslist or whatever, and now they're turning on nuclear reactors to, to kind of fuel Bitcoin. Even just saying that out loud is kind of ridiculous because I was mining Ethereum just because I'm up in Massachusetts and we have 22 and a half cents per kilowatt. And so we were using GPUs when Ethereum ran up in 2021. We couldn't get our hands on ASICs and we didn't have the power in my buddy's basement to do that. Um, but to think now that it's being run by nuclear reactors is kind of crazy. So zooming out, let's zoom out to like 2035 if you can. Do you just see the world where any pubco that still exists just has their own nuclear reactor? Um, I mean, probably not by 2035. I think like big picture energy production, like nuclear is the future of baseload energy, micro nuclear reactors spread around, you know, microgrid technology. There'll be a healthy amount of, you know, renewables still sitting around as they slowly die and fail and do all that fun stuff. The reason like it, the reason nuclear stopped in the U S was because of the tragedies in the seventies. And it was a handful of safety issues that we're well documented that we can have been able to fix since then. Um, and you know, even to date with the nuclear tragedies, like it's caused less harm and death than the entire coal energy industry or renewable industry or any of that. When you look at like casualties from this. So, um, any other energy production, is worse from a casualty standpoint, which is kind of crazy to think about because of how publicized and how uh, in our heads, how bad these nuclear meltdowns were, these failing of these nuclear reactors, um, which is, it's interesting because I've been the guy running around bastardizing renewable energy sources like wind and solar for a long time. Uh, they're intermittent. They're not a good source of energy, right? They're expensive. The only reason they make sense is because of tax incentives or unless you have a really high price buyer power, um, which is fine. Like if you've got tax incentives to go build a solar and 
battery storage or wind and battery storage or no battery storage or thermal storage. Awesome. Go do it. Like it's there. You should be doing it. Um, but ultimately these sites produce power intermittently, which is why it became a good source for Bitcoin mining is because we could take power whenever. So if you're bidding your wind energy negative into a market, cause you don't have a buyer cause the wind's blowing and no one's consuming it, then great. We'll buy it for less than market. <clears throat> not a lot of people have that ability. And that's something that traditional data centers don't have. They don't have the ability to just shut off when, you know, there's too much load on the, on the you know grid or on the system. Um, so nuclear power becomes this thing where it's just constant baseload energy. Um, battery storage may, you know, obviously play a role in the future in buffering the ups and downs of that. But the reality is most of those ups and downs are probably going to be buffered by natural gas peaker power plants. Um, it's just what they're made for, right? You start seeing spikes in the grid that can't be handled by your base load. You kick on a peaker plant, it handles it, you kick it back off. Um, and that's, you know, a pretty easy response. When you look at doing that with renewables, like wind and solar, uh, then your peaker plants are coming on and off all the time. You're still having a massive amount of carbon production because of that. And a lot of the reason why people didn't uh, fund nuclear projects is they always look at like the levelized cost of energy numbers, which don't take into account a lot of that situation. Like, oh, well, if we build this solar farm, it produces energy at this much, but the sun doesn't actually shine all the time, right? It doesn't, even if depending on how they get those numbers, you end up with some issues. Um, and so once you actually put in all the caveats of a renewable, like solar adding in, you know, lifting battery production and how bad that is for the environment, still have to have natural gas peakers to ebb and flow, all that stuff, like the levelized cost of energy of nuclear becomes actually really exciting. So I think as more and more people start to, uh, exit their news source and understand the underlying technology that exists. Again, uh, people will become much more excited about it. You'll see a lot more development and that's exciting for me. So uh, ever since day one, you know, in, in the Bitcoin mining space, I've said that Bitcoin miners just need to build their own power plants, large capex up front, but you control your power costs into the future. If you look globally at the two countries that I, when, when I think of Bitcoin, I think of El Salvador and I think of Bhutan, right? El Salvador was the first country back in 2021 to say, yeah, this is legal tender. And Bhutan, I think since 2015 has been mining Bitcoin on the low. And now obviously they're very public about it and they have some uh, pri private public partnerships with um, I think a couple or one pubco at least. And so they're mining Bitcoin El Salvador's apparently they're mining Bitcoin. And a lot of theirs is hydroelectric. They have a very mountainous terrain, and you know, as the water comes down the hills, they're like, "Sweet, we're gonna get free power off this, or, or relatively free power." Um, and then El Salvador is using volcanoes to use the, I guess, the geothermal to to get that going. If the U.S. like, uh, where does the U.S. have? things like that, that they're using currently that you know of to mine Bitcoin? And I don't know if I'm asking the right question. The question is like, are we using our natural landscape to be able to create the renewables that we need uh, to, or the renewables to be able to uh, energize mines? Yeah. So there's plenty of mines that are actually taking advantage of hydropower. So, you know, out in near the Niagara Falls area, right. And South yep. of that, and you know, some of the farms that have been in the news above New York, are getting a lot of that power. Same thing with like Canada, right? Uh, Manitoba is pretty, you know, prolific from that standpoint and they actually put moratoriums on putting big Bitcoin mining loads on their hydro. Washington has a decent amount of hydro where a lot of miners, you know, started and uh, for better or worse have kind of worked their way through some things out there. Uh, I don't know a whole lot about the U.S.'s geothermal base. Um, it's not talked about a whole bunch, but obviously we have a decent amount of geothermal uh, resources. Um, the biggest thing with geothermal, it's also really expensive to build. And so that's where you make those, uh, you know, whenever it's an investor, it always requires an investor to get this done, right? A bank, someone is going to fund this and they're going to get paid to fund it. And so when you do the economics of building a geothermal power plant, you have to get a PPA. Is that, you know, located in an area where there's actually a population that's going to be able to take that power? Um, that's where Bitcoin mining is unique is because we can just go anywhere. Uh, so if there's people looking to fund it, but when you look at funding a power plant specifically to fund, you know, a data center, whether it's traditional or Bitcoin mining, uh, then you look at the economics of the power plant and is it the most economical power plant to fund? What is the risk? What is the maintenance? What's the, you know, full and cost. And I haven't ran, I used to run those numbers and all kinds of projects for a long time. Uh, and usually geothermal wasn't the most cost effective from a startup CapEx standpoint. 
which is why a lot of people just go to the grid, right? It's like, oh, well, why would I spend all that money on CapEx to then have a maintenance and overhead that's going to cost this much for the next 20 plus years when I can go to the grid and, you know, get a better, you know, ROI for the bank. Um, so it's kind of interesting. So I don't necessarily know I have a good answer for your question. I know we take advantage of some natural resources today. Um, just like, I mean, when you talk about a, like a hydro power plant, there's, you know, there's ones that are capturing, you know, waterfalls. There's ones that are creating dams and blocking that up and dams have a sediment issue and how long are they going to run before the sediment builds up and it becomes a problem. And, um, there's a lot that goes into damming stuff. And if you've ever dealt with trying to build a power plant, try to build a gas power plant, everybody gets mad now because of CO2 emissions. You try to build a solar farm. People don't want, you know, 40, 100, 200 acres covered in solar panels, try to build a wind farm. They don't want, you know, hundreds of acres of you know windmills spread all over the place either and so everywhere you go there's going to reason not to and the dam thing is like hey like you know you put a dam down depending on where you put it and how big it is like they've put dams down and knowingly had to remove you know move cities because they you know flood the city and underneath that water is literally a town um <clears throat> so it becomes a difficult thing to build hydropower now uh from an environmental standpoint like how many you know, rock squirrels or whatever, are we going to cover with water or city? Um, like it's, it's a, it's a big undertaking when you look at those things, same thing with wind, solar, renewable. And that's where nuclear actually has another huge benefit, um, is that it's actually a pretty small footprint for the power it generates. If you wanted to generate the same amount of power with a solar farm or a wind farm as a nuclear power plant, the footprint and go, you know, acre for acre, like it's a, you so much more power from nuclear. The waste thing, like I think we store all the U.S.'s waste in like a handful of football fields footprint, right? And so it's not a it's not a large amount of waste. Obviously, someday, however many years it takes for that to become you know a large enough amount of waste to matter, hopefully we have a way to uh, do more than just cover it in concrete and steel and sit it out there, and we have a way to actually you know dispose of it or uh, accelerate the decay or whatever to get rid of the nuclear waste. Did you ever see the documentary Planet of the Humans? It's a Michael Moore documentary. No, I don't it's, think so. Yeah, it's on YouTube. So I'm going to leave that description. I'll leave the link in the description so everyone can kind of go check it out. But it's a very fascinating look at renewable energies, whether they're wind or they're solar. Those are the two primary ones. You know, everyone's got solar in their house now, or we have, there's incentives all over the country to put solar on your house. Obviously, if you're in a place that gets a lot of sun, I know we have solar here in Massachusetts. We've had it on our roof for probably more than a decade, but it gets into the actual interesting conundrum of climate or like the way you're actually impacting your footprint. That's the words you've been using, right? Your carbon footprint. And that sometimes even to make a solar panel, it may not actually be better for the planet than just sticking with us burning gas. And that's a really interesting one for people that are very renewable focused and like, oh, we have to use renewables because to get what we need to create a solar panel can be so much worse off actually for the environment. And that's just interesting. So anyways, I'm going to leave that. It's a Michael Moore documentary. I wouldn't share if I didn't think it was by someone who's uh, fairly reputable in the documentary uh, film game, but it's a fascinating look. And then, so when you add in the idea of, uh, of nuclear, I, I worked with a colleague for a couple of years ago and she hated nuclear and I'd be like, Oh, why do you hate it? But she was a little bit older and I think she was really hearkening back to the safety issues that do come from just a time, you know, 30, 40, 50, 50 years ago now where there were more safety concerns. And I think that if it weren't for those, I wonder how the conversation would be around nuclear. Cause I think there's a lot of FUD around nuclear that maybe isn't founded, but I'm not sure. Anyway, um, it's, I wanted to see if you'd seen that, that, <clears throat> documentary because now you're going to watch it and you're going to want to hop on and talk about it for hours because it's one of the more fascinating documentaries about uh the environment yeah and a lot of that stuff that you just kind of mentioned there uh so one is like you know is renewable actually greener like what's the footprint of creating it versus something else like i dug into that with uh, electric cars um yep. a while back and for the most part like electric cars aren't super great because of the battery um and it just depends on how long that battery actually lasts before it has to be recycled uh you know what does it equal when it actually gets thrown away and the the cars that actually made the most sense from a green standpoint were actually like some of the hybrids because the batteries were smaller um, and so as they improve their you know, fuel efficiency by using the battery, the battery wasn't so outsized uh, to kill that like actual positive benefit. Whereas the cars that were fully electric with large batteries, 
uh, doesn't look like they ever defeat their carbon footprint because eventually the battery's lifespan, uh, you know, wears down. It's lithium batteries. So even though we're better at charging, they last way longer than they ever did. You know, they're still not 100% efficient and they still degrade over time. And so eventually when you have to replace that, it becomes a problem. The uh, nuclear stuff, and I think that's the biggest issue the U.S. has had with nuclear was just the all the scare from the handful of disasters that we've had. Um, and like, I used to be a huge junkie YouTube guy and there's a guy named Kyle Hill who does a lot on the, uh, like nuclear power and nuclear disasters and even the nuclear bombs. And he's just done a lot of documentaries on that. And they're actually really good. Um, <clears throat> he's a pretty science-based person. Uh, there's a few things that I probably try to argue with him about, but for the most part, he has uh, good documentaries on those. Good for people to learn and educate themselves because we're definitely moving into a future where nuclear is going to be prominent. Um, and it looks like it's going to be driven by large compute companies, you know, building power plants that are nuclear. Yeah, it certainly feels like we're in an energy arms race. And when I was thinking about hopping on today and talking to you about some of this stuff, that was like, I was like, oh, is that the, is that the title of the episode, right? And the energy arms race is on to, to mine sats. Looking ahead, we're at the fourth quarter now of 2024. I honestly don't know how we got here. And uh, 2025 is is just a minute away. You've talked when we first hopped on here that the hash price maybe isn't where we want it to be. Is there a number for you or or at what moment is it going to like click in and then everyone's going to want to start mining again? And I want to add another question on there if that wasn't convoluted enough. Not only like what's that breaking or the tipping point moment of like hash price or, or something or some news thing that's going to be like, oh, everyone's into mining. In June or July of this past year, Anthony Power wrote an article and he was talking about how the stocks of all of the pubcos who had traditionally been just mining Bitcoin, the ones that had diversified and said, Hey, we are going to do more HPC where we're going to get into AI. We want to diversify a little bit. All their stocks went up compared to the ones that just said we're only Bitcoin only in the pubcos. They went up like three to four X. But the thing that stays in my mind and lives rent free from that article was Anthony saying at the end, that's great. Short-term stock price appreciation. Everyone loves it. Shareholders love it. It brings attention to, to, to Bitcoin mining at the end of the day. But he said, what happens if Bitcoin explodes? Are they going to regret that decision? Are those stocks going to go down? And then the ones that will pump will be the pub codes that stayed with Bitcoin. So I don't know. There's That's kind of a contextual thing to say, hey, like, you know, how, how are you thinking moving forward? Uh, if you were just looking at the pub codes, do you think that that's the play? I know at Compass, we are Bitcoin only, and that seems to be our, our, fu our destined future. Um, but also, you know, is there going to be a moment where those that have invested into AI infrastructure are going to be like, oh, we should just stay with Bitcoin? Right. Um, and then also from like a, a retail standpoint, that's kind of an institutional level, maybe. But from a retail standpoint, is there a moment and I wasn't around for the last bull run at Compass, but it was is there a moment you for you moving forward? Is it the 100K when Bitcoin hits 100K? Everyone's going to try to figure out how to get the picks and axes, which is mining Bitcoin. Or is it something else that you are kind of looking ahead as you are working with the team? Because as we said before, we hopped on here. We have to build in the in the bear market to be able to be properly positioned. So when the bull market is on, whenever that happens, we can totally you know provide the best service for our customers. Uh, so I guess the the first one or the big topic there was uh, when do we think the bull runs going? When does everybody come back? When does everybody get excited about mining? And uh, I mean, I, I've only been with Compass for two years, but in all these other cycles, basically what I see happen from a retail standpoint is everybody wants something, they want the miners to be less expensive, right? The biggest thing right now is, oh, it's too expensive or the uh, hosting rate's too expensive. And the rates are pretty low right now compared to what they've been over the last you know, year, two years. Uh, they're at some pretty low bottoms, and but you still get that, ah, oh, it's too expensive. And then what happens is all of a sudden, a lot of inventory gets purchased and there's not enough, there's not a whole lot of miners sitting in, the US that are easily able to go plug in. Like you guys can see on the Compass website, there's turnkey miners. Like we continue to buy miners, we plug them in and we allow you guys to buy them. So there's no <clears throat> delay risks or things like that that you have to deal with waiting for the next site to come online. Um, but eventually all of a sudden stocks get low. Everybody buys up all these miners and then the price starts to creep up and then creeps up and creeps up. And it's when all of a sudden the price jumps on all the stuff, the hosting rates go up, the prices go up, then everybody tries to jump in. I very much think it's a FOMO standpoint, whether that's buying Bitcoin mining, Bitcoin itself or getting into Bitcoin mining um, or other stocks in general. Like I just think it's how our 
monkey brains are probably wired is, oh no, I'm going to miss out. And so as soon as those prices start to jump up due to constraints in inventory or even site capacity, um, that's when you start to see everything then take off. And right now there's still quite a bit of capacity out there for large, uh, purchases and to place large amounts of miners, but there's not a whole lot of like retail capacity where there's just, you know, MOQ one or five or 10 or whatever slots sitting on a shelf. Um, and that's kind of interesting. And so as I see that large amount of hosting or, you know, ready built facilities that are available, uh, start to fill up and are no longer on the market. I think that's going to be the point in which I'm like, ah, it's time because there's no more space available. The prices are all going to go up. So, you know, the price goes down to all the facilities are full. When all the facilities are full, prices start going up. Bitcoin miner prices go down until there's no inventory and then prices go through the roof. And there, I've seen some really large purchases of like older generation hardware. And obviously we've been seeing Pubco purchases of newer gen hardware on a regular basis. Um, so that's kind of like, it's just that supply and demand. And once that supply is gone, then you get the fear of missing out and everybody runs on. Um, and I think that contributes to this like land and power arms race uh, in like, obviously Bitcoin mining is a drop in the pond compared to what the power consumption of traditional data center looks like. Like these monsters, Amazon, Microsoft, like they're Google, they're just so huge. It's not even like we're not in the same ballpark. Um, even the, you know, big pub codes that are doing AI and things like that. It's like, you're, they're not a hyperscaler Amazon data center. <laughs> it's different. Um, and so I think that we're seeing two different types of land grabs. Uh, like we source sites all the time, both turnkey sites or brand new greenfield projects. Uh, I don't know when this podcast is going to go out. So Jarrett, you'll have to either cut this out or add it back in. But hopefully, you know, we sign some agreements tomorrow to do another greenfield project in Iowa, uh, starting at eight megawatts and then going to, you know, getting that out to 30 megawatts as we, you know, build a substation out there and then do a, you know, kind of a cousin site 30 minutes away from it. So if everything goes well, uh, you know, we're, we're doing the exact same thing as everybody else, but as far as compass goes, we do it in, you know, 10 to 40 megawatt chunks, uh, not hundreds of megawatt chunks. Uh, so that, you know, that's what we can handle and take down and provide a good customer experience for our clients. And as far as like Compass is a Bitcoin first company, and I definitely agree with that. Uh, there's been points in my life in which I was Bitcoin only and mostly still am. Um, but, it, you know, it doesn't stop us from being able to run, you know, self-hosted AI workloads. If people want bare metal rack space, like that's pretty straightforward. Like maybe there's going to be a resurgence of that where all of a sudden, you know, bare metal co-location becomes a thing again. It doesn't take a whole lot of work to take a portion of a Bitcoin mining farm and stand up modular data centers specifically for those workloads. So there's people out there that want that, but they don't want the, you know, security risks of cloud or they don't, they want more of a custom self-hosted stack, hands-on white glove service type situation. Um, that's types of things that Compass would get into on the traditional data center side. Obviously, we have a robust line of operations techs that have been uh, operating Bitcoin mining farms. Most of them have background in traditional data center, you know, network administrator, IT space. Um, you now, Bitcoin mining has no formal training for data center space. Like, yeah, that's been around for a while. They've got that stuff nailed down. All the enterprise stuff knows how to talk to each other for a reason. Bitcoin, we're still trying to get the manufacturers to let their firmware talk to the same systems uh, with the same language right now. So uh, <clears throat> I think it's pretty exciting. And, you know, if there's people out there who want, you know, small self-hosted solution for themselves, like we're happy to dig in on that. Uh, on the altcoin mining side, that's a different conundrum <laughs> because, you know, though we'd be happy to, you know, potentially host altcoin miners again, the problem is that there's, you know, everybody who does it ends up with, a different experience and that experience for most people revolves around their hardware not being supported by the manufacturer and there's no parts to repair it so you get a low life out of the miners and if you don't roi that really quickly then you have a bad experience and we are trying to avoid clients having bad experiences 
That was well said. <laughs> I think we, that is our number one thing. We are trying to avoid clients having bad experiences. We want as much uptime and as much, you know, we want clients online. And I think the thing that I was, I was recently at Permissionless in Salt Lake City and talking with some other colleagues who I never really get to see IRL and it was great. And we were just talking about the challenges of when that client who has one minor, their minor goes offline and hundred percent of their hash is down. That's, we don't want that. And we want to work as quickly as we can to solve that and make sure that they're getting their hash back up online. So um, you and I could probably talk for another hour about energy land grabs and the interesting world that we're going to get into where we're going to have FOMO again around uh, TerraHash, which is going to be exciting because right now I don't think it exists, at least per the conversations I recently had with some some customers and clients out in Salt Lake City, but we're going to get there. Um, so I want to thank you for hopping on the pod today, Shannon, and taking the time. If you're watching this on YouTube, go ahead and subscribe. If you're listening to this on a podcast platform, please go ahead and subscribe and make sure you're following us on socials uh, at Compass Mining on LinkedX and YouTube. And Shannon, once again, thank you for taking the time. Thanks, Jarrett. Appreciate it, man.